Mr. Secretary, thank you very, very much for coming. I know you had nothing else to do today, so. It's been a busy Monday already. Thanks for having me here. I did, really appreciate it. Did something happen this morning I don't know about? Or? No, oh, okay, all, okay. all is well. I'm here. It's okay. Been. So um, you became our 70th United States Secretary of State in April of 2018. Um, you're happy with the job? Is it as much as fun as you thought it was going to be? Every day. <laughs> So uh, what are the most significant foreign policy issues of concern to you? What do you think are the biggest challenges we have in our country right now in foreign policy area? So, you know, I get asked this question about sort of rank ordering the challenges. I mean, that's not an original question. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so, look, it's an, it's an important question. Where it's, it's about priorities and resources right. and how do you allocate time and uh, how do you think about the problem set. You know, for me, the first, the, the first task when I came in now 16, 17 months ago to the State Department having, ha after having been the CIA director uh, was to make sure the State Department was ready in the moment of crisis. So I spent a lot of time making sure that my team was prepared for the day that every CEO tries to deal with too, right? What happens when something really bad happens that was unexpected and is your team capable? Do you have the resources and people that can respond in the moment for something that frankly okay. you hadn't given enough thought about? In terms of priorities, uh, you know, I sp I, every morning the first thing I do is read about China. So I, I take time and talk about all the broad array of issues that present uh, both real opportunity for the United States and risk to America from China. Well, let's talk about China for a moment. Uh, the trade negotiations are going on. You're not the lead in the trade negotiations. I think Bob Lighthizer is taking the lead in that. But can you make any progress in non-trade issues until the trade issue is resolved? Uh, yeah, and, and we, we've made some. Um, we've had other places where we've gone backwards. The, the Chinese have frankly been uh, very helpful on North Korea. So they have done more to enforce the UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea than ever at any time in history. Um, they're, they're helpful with us today in Afghanistan and the project there too. It's something folks don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, so far, so good with respect to respecting our sanctions uh, enforcement on the Islamic Republic of Iran, although we uh, sanctioned a Chinese company last week or perhaps it was the week before uh, for having violated those sanctions. but So there are places we can work with China. There are lots of diplomatic fronts where we have, uh, we don't share the same values, but we have overlapping interests and we work on those problems. What would be the U.S. response if the Chinese were to send military into Hong Kong uh, to put down the protests there? Yeah, so I, I never answer hypotheticals about what we'll do or won't do, so uh, well played. Well, I thought I could. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, ha having said that, uh, look, uh, we, we, we've been pretty clear. Uh, pro protest is, is appropriate. We see this in the United States. I am confident there'll be protesters okay. when I drive through the building at the State Department today. Uh, and uh, and we, we hope the Chinese will do the right thing with respect to the, respecting the agreements that are in place with respect to Hong Kong. Okay. So you have been to North Korea, and you've met with the leader of North Korea on a few occasions, and you've been there where the president has met with him. So what type of person is he? Does he have great inter interesting thoughts? Does he have, does he speak English? Or do you communicate in English with him? And can you just kind of summarize what your impression is of the leader of North Korea? Yeah, so I've spent more time with him than any American. I passed Dennis Rodman on the last trip. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, so he, he, look, he's, he's, he's bright. He, he has managed, he has managed to rise to the level of leadership. Uh, in a difficult environment where he was a very young man when his time came. Uh, from my very first interaction with him, he's been very candid uh, with me about the things that are important to him, the priority set, and how the negotiations might proceed. Uh, he's now repeated that he's prepared to denuclearize. It's now time to execute. Uh, and I, I hope that we can achieve that. Well, I hope, uh, I, I head to Asia tomorrow midday. I'll be in Bangkok for a couple days. We, we hope that we can have working level discussion starting again very soon so that we can unlock the Rubik's Cube. It's a, it's a real challenge that he is presented with as the leader of North Korea as well. And we hope that, we hope that he can see his way clear so we can get that brighter future that President Trump has talked about. Do you expect a third summit to be announced anytime soon, the date and time of it? And uh, there's, there's, there's nothing in the works. Okay. There's, there's no, nothing planned. And uh, why did the last summit end before the lunch even occurred? Why did it kind of abruptly end? Uh, there was a big bid-ask spread, to put it in economic terms. Right. Uh, we, we'd had a, a number, I, I can't go into all this, but we had a number of conversations about right. a broad range of issues in the run-up to that. My team had worked very, very hard. Uh, and 
and it just turned out that the idea that the leaders could bridge that gap okay. in that moment turned out to, to not work okay. that day. But do you think there, the U.S. position has been that we would not lift sanctions until there was a so-called denuclearization? But would you be willing to consider having the uh, North Koreans keep whatever they have in nuclear weapons now and then lift sanctions if they didn't do more than they have now? Or is that something that's too hypothetical? Too hypothetical. Oh, okay. I didn't want to give you the answer. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So yeah. look, I'll say this. I, I've, I've talked about this publicly a couple times. Uh, we, we hope that there are creative solutions to unlocking this. It is a very difficult challenge for each of us. We have to remember, too, these aren't U.S. sanctions. These are U.N. Security Council resolutions. These are global okay. sanctions put on by a, every single country. And so we are, we are mindful that we are the steward for enforcing those. Let's go to the easier part of the world, the Middle East, okay? So um, <laughs> the Straits of Hormuz, are we committed to keeping open the Straits of Hormuz at any cost militarily? Yeah, we're we're going to keep them open. Uh, we'll, we're going to build out a maritime security plan Countries from all across the world who have a vested interest in keeping those waterways open will participate. Uh, it, it will take more time than we wish it would take, but I, I'm very confident that the world understands its importance, that America is prepared to be a significant part of that, but we need countries from all across the world to assist us in protecting commercial transit. We'll, we'll be successful. But our position, I presume, is that if a U.S. ship were taken uh, by the Iranians, we would presumably do something militarily, I guess, I don't know. But what about if, if uh, a ship is taken that's a British ship or some other nationality, are we not committed to uh, recovering that ship or doing something to defend those um, ships? Well, we've seen it. We've seen them take a British ship. So this right. isn't a hypothetical. Uh, and we are, we are working, I was working with, what, I guess I'm now working with my third British foreign minister since I've been a secretary of state, uh, but working with the uh, British to find the solution to both A, uh, right that injustice, and second, prevent it from happening again, so to establish deterrence. Right. That's the mission set. Now, recently you gave a visa for the foreign minister of Iran to come to the United States for a UN event. You're familiar with that? That's true. Yes. yes. Okay, so when he was in the United States, were there any indirect or direct talks with him and the State Department about anything that you can talk about? No talks. No talks. And, okay. Any Although he spoke. Uh, the American media decided to give him a megaphone to talk about okay. uh, things that are untrue going on in the Islamic Republic of Iran and gave him a chance to lie vociferously to the American people. I look forward to the chance to speak to the Iranian people in that same way, uh, but truthfully, All right. tell them honestly about what's going on inside of their own country. I, so far, they've not taken me up on that offer. Now, President Trump has imposed uh, tough sanctions on Iran. Uh, do you think they are going to have the effect of bringing Iran to the negotiating table or not? Uh, you have to step back a little bit. Uh, r remember the objective. The objective is the national security strategy that was laid out now two and a half years ago with respect to the Middle East. So it's, a, it's broader. We tend to focus on the tactical. You have to step back and think about what we're doing more broadly in the Middle East. Uh, with respect to Iran, it's the world's largest state sponsor of terror. It has uh, the capacity to continue to work towards developing a nuclear weapon system, which would cause proliferation risks all throughout the Middle East. And so we are very concerned about that as well. Our, 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 uh, our chosen strategy uh, was to take a 180 degree turn from what the previous administration has done. They created opportunity for enormous wealth for the kleptocrats in Iran and for them to uh, underwrite Hezbollah uh, militias in Iraq, uh, the Houthis in Yemen that are, even as we speak, preparing to continue their attacks on Saudi Arabia. Uh, we, we've decided to go the other way. We, we're trying to reduce their resources to conduct terror campaigns all around the world, build out their missile systems and their nuclear program, and we've been incredibly effective at that. I remember, David, uh, I'm sure no one in this room, but many here in Washington said that American sanctions alone won't work. Right. Well, they've worked. Uh, we have taken over 95% of the crude oil that was being shipped by Iran all around the world. We have taken it off the market, and we've done so with, I checked when I came in, Brent crude is at 63.34. Uh, 17, 18 percent lower than when we withdrew from the JCPOA. So we have we have managed both to protect the economic growth that the world needs, while doing our best to deny resources to the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran regime. Prospect of another Iranian agreement, one that's more favorable to your point of view and the president's point of view, is that likely to happen this year, next year, or you just can't predict? I don't do time. I, 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 I time timelines are uh, a fool's errand. Uh, in my business. Um, there, there are okay. fools aired in my business when I ran a right. small company in Kansas, but too. The Iranians are now enriching uranium at a greater level than they were before. Do you worry that somebody, Israel, might attack the Iranian facilities, or are you not worried about that? 
uh, yes, they're enriching more than they were under uh, the agreement. Their, tempor their temporary reduction in right. uh, enriched uranium uh, has now uh, ended. They're moving back in the right. wrong direction. We're, we're urging them to, to think about it. But for us, it's not about these uh, levels okay. set in the JCPOA. All right. it's, it's about their capacity to build out a nuclear weapons system in a time frame that matters to you and your kids and your grandkids. The previous agreement didn't remotely touch that. In the Middle East, do you see any prospect for peace between Israel and the Palestinians? There's been um, talk of a plan, and uh, do you see any progress being made? So there's a reason it hasn't been solved for 40 years uh, or more. Um, in the end, uh, this will be the decision of the Prime Minister of Israel and the leadership uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. I, I, I've been uh, deeply involved in Mr. Kushner's efforts there. Okay. Uh, my, the, uh, he'll, he'll be traveling, my team will be traveling with him in the coming days uh, to flesh out for our partners in the region uh, our path forward. Uh, in, in the end, we can present our vision, our plan, what we hope they will engage on. We hope we get the Gulf states to join us in that effort and frankly the European countries too to say this is a, the, the path forward. But in the end, um, the decision about whether to, to make this fundamental rapprochement is up to those two countries, those right. two leaders. But is our position, the United States government's position, that we prefer a one-state solution or a two-state solution? You'll see our plan shortly. Okay, would you give us a hint or? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We, we, pref we prefer what the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis ag agree to and what the nature of that relationship will look like. Okay, any progress you think between uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and um, the UAE and resolving their dispute. Are we in the middle of that? No, they're, 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 they're in the middle of it. <laughs> okay, so we're uh, not in the middle of trying to resolve we, that. We, we, we've made clear, we, we hope that, um, that they will join together. We think Gulf okay. state unity on the issues that matter to American, America citizens matters. What about Yemen? Any progress in reducing the conflicts there? Yeah, real progress. Uh, it is uneven. Uh, in the end, the, uh, the player who will get to play the ultimate final card there would be the Iranians. Uh, the Houthis have to make a decision. Right. They, they, they've got to decide if they want to continue down the path of being disruptive and uh, accepting Iranian missiles and launching them into Saudi Arabia. Now, negotiations are underway with the Taliban in the Middle East. The U.S. is involved in that. Do you see any progress in reducing um, our need to be in Afghanistan, anything in the near future? Yeah, real progress. Uh, I try not to do timelines, but I'm optimistic. Uh, we're not just negotiating with the Taliban. That's the story. Uh, the truth of the matter is we're talking to all Afghans. So we've spoken with the, uh, President Ghani. I spoke to him on Friday night or Friday morning. Uh, we're speaking with the op opposition, those folks that are not inside the government. We're speaking with Taliban officials. We have, uh, Ambassador Khalil Azad has worked all across Afghanistan with, uh, I'm, when I was there last, I met with NGOs, I met with women's groups, uh, a, a broad swath of Afghanistan. We want them to take their country back and we want to reduce what is for us uh, tens of billions of dollars a year in expenditures and enormous risk uh, to your kids and your grandkids who are fighting for America. We, we think there's a path to reduce violence, achieve reconciliation, and still make sure that the uh, American counterterrorism effort in Afghanistan uh, uh, has a value and the potential to reduce risk here in the states. Before the next presidential election in the United States, would you expect we reduce, reduce our troops in Afghanistan? Uh, that's my directive from the President of the United States. He's been unambiguous. End the endless wars. Draw down, reduce. It won't just be us. Uh, those of you who have served know that resolute support has countries from all across Europe and around the world. Um, we, hope, we hope that uh, overall the need for uh, uh, combat forces in the region is reduced. All right. So yes, I, it's not only my expectation, it's, uh, it would be job enhancing. Okay. <laughs> all right. So on Russia, um, you've met with uh, Mr. Putin many times, I assume. Uh, a few times, yes, sir. And any impressions of him that you might convey? Is he very smart, very tough? Does he understand English? That you convey your thoughts to him in, in English, or does he have an interpreter? Or I, he... I, I think I think he speaks English plenty well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, look, he, he's uh, he's very clear about the things that are in Russia's interest, the things they're working on. Uh, you know, we had a strategic dialogue with them uh, that we hope will build into something that handles a broad set of proliferation issues, not just nuclear proliferation issues, but a broad array of uh, proliferation. So we hope China will uh, will join that set of conversations. We think today's in today's world, these agreements need to have China be part of them. For, uh, and, I, and, I, and I hope that President Putin will support us, and I think he will. For the time being, though, uh, would you say that um, there is any progress in Ukraine or anything relating to Ukraine? Is that 
something that's just off the table right now in terms of the discussions? Uh, so we're, we're, we're engaging with the new government in Ukraine. They just finished up their parliamentary elections uh, last week. Uh, new president. I, I hope that that will engender uh, a more creative set of ideas about how to resolve this problem. The conflict in Ukraine is real. They're still fighting, not every day, but a lot. For the, uh, and it's very real. The Crimea, do you think that's not never going to be returned to uh, Ukraine? Is that uh, right? The U.S. position is that that is unacceptable. Crimea must come back. Now, there are protests now in Russia about uh, local elections, um, and uh, the leader of the protest is in jail, and there's been reports that he's been poisoned. We don't know if that's accurate or not. Do you have any comment on what's going on there? Is the United States protesting to the Russian government about what's occurring? Uh, you know, I, I, I've read the reports. I, I don't have anything to add this morning. I, I, think, I think everyone understands uh, the U.S. position, right? We, it, this goes for, you, you asked about uh, Hong Kong earlier, Russia, all these places. Um, okay. we, we always support freedom of expression, freedom to uh, practice one's religion, uh, to, uh, to live out one's okay. conscience. We, we hope that for every citizen of the world. Uh, you were the head of the CIA at the beginning of this administration. Do you have any doubt that the Russians interfered with our last presidential election? Oh, none. None. Okay. So um, have you conveyed And the that? one before that. And the one before that. Okay. And the one before that. And the one in 2018. People forget we've had an election since 2016. I hear people say, oh, we have to protect 2020. Well, the good people who ran in 2018 cared a lot about us protecting that one. We did so very effectively. And we'll do so again in 2020. There is and it's not just the last thing. I, just, I, I know this town. I know exactly what will get reported. Just so you know, it ain't just Russia. That's bad English. I'll try and correct it. Um, there, are, there are more nations than just Russia who are attempting to undermine Western democracy. That has been true since the founders right. created this great nation. And so we have to be ever vigilant. There is legislation that's passed the House now in the Senate to um, give more resources to keep the Russians from being able to do this again. Is the administration supportive of the legislation, which seems to be blocked right now in the Senate? Yeah, I don't know the details of the legislation. I'm convinced uh, the State Department has all the resources it needs to perform its part of that function. We, we have what we need. We have the authorities we need. We have the money we need. It's the, the burden is on me to execute And that. have you communicated to uh, Mr. Putin that we do not like what he's done before and he shouldn't do it again? Uh, on a number of occasions. And what's his response? Uh, noted. Okay. <laughs> Um, that's, a, that's a diplomatic term for I hear you, brother. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, he doesn't admit anything, I assume, but okay. So with respect to England, uh, there's a new prime minister. Uh, you have met uh, Boris Johnson before? I have. I met him when I was CIA director, and uh, I believe he was foreign secretary at the time. When I met okay. Does the, the current uh, Trump administration support a Brexit, or would you prefer that there be a remain, or do you not take a position on that? I, I have confidence in the British people. Okay. Now, the British ambassador had to resign because his cables were leaked um, by somebody. Um, do you tell your own ambassadors they should be a little bit more careful about what they say to you because somebody could leak what they're uh, writing? Is that a worry? Not at all. And if I did, they'd ignore me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, right, they have a duty. They have responsibility. Our, our task is for them to tell us what they're saying, the, the, the power of the State Department, the fact that we have these officers on the ground. Uh, many countries can do policy in think tanks, but we have people every place in the world. We want them to give us the granularity that you can only get with those interactions, and we expect that they'll report them accurately, truthfully, candidly, and then our mission is to make sure they don't end up in the Washington Post. Now, in respect to Mexico, um, we have been concerned about people coming over the border. Are you confident that the Mexican government is now doing what it can to keep more people from not coming over the border? They are. So they're doing enough, you think? or you're No, it's not enough. And you still have okay. a high side of 2,000 every day. It's, uh, it's unacceptable. And so they need to do more. We need to do more. Congress needs to change uh, the rules. Uh, we have to create a deterrence, right? Okay. It, it has to be the case that those who want to come here legally can, and those who want to come by some other mechanism choose not to because they understand that it not, they're not going to find a way. I remember this as a member of Congress. People would call my office and say, uh, hey, we, 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 we live and pick a country around the world, and they'd say they want to come here and get citizenship. And, you know, <laughs> anyway, I won't tell you the joke okay. we told, but the, but the simplest way to do it would be go to Mexico and come on. It, but what you want to encourage them to do is to file their paperwork, go through the lawful process, right. become citizens. We're the most welcoming nation in the world. We will always be. 
But it, it, it's not the case that we can be lawless or have our sovereignty broken through having this mass immigration and a non-lawful mechanism. It's truly, there's a national security risk, uh, very, very broadly speaking. And so when I speak with my Mexican counterparts, I was in El Salvador last week speaking with my El Salvadoran counterpart who understands whose who's challenge it is. It's theirs, not ours. We've got to get this right. Oh, in Mexico and Canada, we have redone NAFTA and now USMCA, but Congress hasn't passed it. Are you worried that Congress might not pass that legislation? I hope they will. I hope they will. The president's doing everything he can to create growth here in the United States of America, and USMCA would contribute to that substantially. And so I hope, I hope they'll pass it. I, I'm out of that. I, I don't do vote counting anymore. I did that for six years, and so I'm out. Speaking of south of the border, Venezuela, uh, would the U.S. ever send troops in if that was necessary to keep further violence from occurring there? So you started trying to get me at the beginning, now you're trying at the end. Uh, the president has said pretty clearly, uh, we're going to do all that it takes to make Thank sure you. the Venezuelan people get democracy back, and that's the, that's the mission set. We're closer today than we were uh, several months ago. Uh, but in the end, uh, we'll do our part, and the, the nations in the region, we've built out a great coalition from uh, members of the OAS to what we call the Lima Group to 56 or 58 other countries who are joining us and who understand Maduro is not the duly elected president. Um, progress every day. Now, President Trump has uh, sometimes tweeted things that are not favorable about some people working for him. Uh, he's never tweeted anything unfavorable about you. It's what early. Is, it's early. So what is, the, what is the secret of your success in your relationship with President? You didn't know him before he was elected, did you? I did not. I met him the day I, uh, I interviewed to be CIA director. Just and who recommended you to be CIA director? I don't know for sure. I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. You mean the CIA doesn't have the ability to figure out who recommended <laughs> you? And you should, you should figure that you, out. You, David, you've never believed that the CIA only does foreign espionage. Okay, I got it. Okay. You, uh, I've never been able to convince you. Okay, so but it's somebody, true. somebody recommended you. Yeah. You had an interview with I, them? I think the vice president was likely the person who, who okay. I had known and served with as a member of Congress. And did you say, I like the CIA job, but I'd like to be Secretary of State, or this came out as a surprise to you? It was a complete surprise to me. I was, uh, and I was honored to serve as the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay, so some people say that you should run for the Senate from Kansas. In fact, Mitch McConnell, I think, has twisted your arm a few times to do that. Mm -hmm. um, can you say definitively that you will not run? The filing date is June of 2020, you probably know. So any... Uh, I didn't, but thank you for reminding okay, me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so would you consider that, or are you putting that off the table for a while? Or? It's, it's off the table. As a, as a practical matter, I, I'm going to serve as Secretary of State okay. uh, every day that I get the chance to do so. Look, uh, we all serve at the president, the president you talked about, uh, that uh, Director Coates, who I have enormous respect for, will be leaving the administration soon. Okay. He's served nobly. Uh, there, there's a time for everyone, and uh, I, I hope I get to do this for a while longer. Uh, my experience is that sometimes when people get close to a president, they see the job up close, they say, well, I can do that job too. Has that occurred to you that maybe <laughs> um, you could do the job, and would you have any interest in running for president at some point in your life? I try to answer this consistently. I have never been able to predict what my next gig will be, and I suspect that's, that's the case with respect to this. I, I, I will say this. Um, uh, the service that I've had the chance to do, I'm almost 20 years now in federal service, 18 years of federal service in my time in the Army uh, and then in Congress and now in the executive branch. It has been a blessing. I hope I've left things a little bit better and I, I do feel an obligation. America has given me an awful lot and if I thought I could do a good turn, um, there, there's, there's nothing I wouldn't right. consider doing for America. Okay, but let's suppose the president is reelected. Would you be willing to serve as Secretary of State for one, two, three, four years of a second term, or have you thought about that yet? I haven't thought about it yet. Uh, you know, <laughs> hard to know, hard to answer those questions. The real question is would the president still want Mike Pompeo as his Secretary of State? Okay, so um, when you have decisions with the president, meetings with him, is he best with oral communications, written communications? What's the process by which decisions are made? Is it through the NSC or, yeah. or informal? Uh, so there's a very robust NSC process. Uh, when I brief him myself, I always prefer to have a document. It's the way I prefer to receive information. Um, so I almost always bring something, uh, a one-page summary at the very least that says, here, here's the outline of what it is that I think are the priorities and how we should think about how we should frame this particular problem. And then the president uh, does like to engage in oral exchanges and 
I, I found them to be uh, elucidating for myself. I often learn things as well. He's very focused on where the money is, right. how we use economic leverage to achieve our diplomatic ends. Now, except when Henry Kissinger was both Secretary of State and National Security Advisor at the same time, generally there's been some tension between Secretaries of State and National Security Advisors. How is your relationship with John Bolton? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's always tension among leaders of, of different organizations. We, we come at these things with, from a, a different viewpoint. Uh, Ambassador Bolton has his responsibility to try and make sure all the ideas are vetted and get to the President. Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Energy, uh, the Intelligence Committee each have their mission sets. There's, uh, we have robust, lively debates. I agree with each of them often and disagree with okay. most of them sometimes. So we have a few dozen ambassadors here. Uh, what would you give them as insight as the best way to influence the President of the United States on foreign policy matters? Yeah, deliver value. That's what I talk about every day. That's what you all do every day in your business. It's not about does he like Mike or does he like Al or, or Alice. It's about did you show up with an informed, fact-based theory that can deliver the outcomes that are in the president's commander's intent. If we do that, if we show up with the best answer, um, we'll, we'll drive policy. If we don't, we'll just be banging our gums. Now, there are reports today that uh, the new head of the uh, Central Intelligence or uh, CNI, uh, the DNI it will be um, um, John Radcliffe from uh, Congress, who you served with in Congress. Some people say he is too political for that position. You've served in CIA. Do you believe he is too political for that position? Yeah, I, I know John some. We, he was, his first term, I think, was my final term in Congress, so I know him reasonably well. He's very smart. Uh, I'm very confident he'll do a good job. I, I remember people saying I'd be too li political to be the CIA director, too. I, I hope that history will, okay. will inform us all that that wasn't the case, that I did my job that I delivered on behalf of the American people in an appropriate way and didn't allow politics to interfere with delivering important, timely, fact-based intelligence to the President of the United States. So in your career, you were first in your class at West Point. So how do you become first in your class at West Point? That's uh, pretty <laughs> tough. I mean, uh, what happened to uh, all the other people who were second, third, and fourth? Did they become <laughs> anything? And So one of them is the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> okay. Right, so he's a classmate of mine as well. I give him a hard time about our relative order of finish. Yes. Okay. Now, you uh, went to Harvard Law School. Why did you abandon the practice of law? I had a great opportunity. I was practicing law at Williams and Connolly here. Uh, I had great partners I worked for. I, unlike many, I actually enjoyed my time there. I was older that I okay. had gone to law school a little bit later, but I had a chance to start a business in Kansas with uh, three of my best friends in the whole world. And so we started a company that was a machine shop in Wichita, Kansas and uh, spent I the next 15 years. I thought you once told me you were negotiating with somebody on the opposite side on that deal, and that person wound up to be your wife. Is that true? Right? It's true. She, she took my money twice. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So what is the best part about being Secretary of State? Uh, I, I love Susan, by the way. We're still married. And it's, everything's good. <laughs> yeah. You had to say that, otherwise you I did. I have home. friends in the room who are, are okay. texting her right now All as right. well. So, yes. uh, <laughs> All right, so the best part of being Secretary of State is what? Uh, you get a chance to, uh, to help uh, ordinary Americans understand what we're doing and try and deliver them an environment where fewer and fewer of their kids have to be uh, in armed conflict. That's our mission set every day, to get American outcomes through diplomacy. And what's the worst part about being Secretary of State? I haven't figured that out yet. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying every minute of what I'm doing. I, I truly feel that I've been given this, uh, this remarkable privilege to serve and I'm trying to do my best to deliver on that every day. The State Department itself, are you involved with a lot of the Foreign Service officers? Are you um, trying to encourage them to be more, more involved in the State Department? Or how do you try to deal with the Foreign Service uh, officers? Yeah, um, look, the, one of the things that I love doing is uh, leading teams, leading organizations. It's what I loved when I was a platoon leader, when I ran Thayer Aerospace in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, and so when I came in the very beginning, we had deep plans for how to make the Foreign Service officers, our civil servants, our local employed, staff uh, better. So we've got uh, real training programs in the works. We've developed a, a, what we call the ethos for the 20th, 21st century diplomat, um, each of which is aimed at making, th these folks will be there long after I'm gone, many of them, right? Uh, they came here before me and they will be here after I'm gone. I wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to grow and learn and deliver on behalf of America in their space. And so we have an obligation to take good care of them and to make sure they get the training and education they need as well. Let me just conclude. We are out of time. I noticed you have very colorful socks on. Is that part of your diplomatic? Uh, it is. It is. I bring a little bit of DOD with me every moment. Yes, these are Army soldiers, toy soldiers. It's a 
bit of an inside joke, and I have now like 40 pairs of these, so yes. 40 pairs? <laughs> yes. Okay. I have so, friends from all across the world sent them after the first photo with, so, there was a picture of when I was with my North Korean counterpart with these, and everybody thought it was funny. So now you're leaving when, the United States? You're leaving? I leave tomorrow, tomorrow? midday. For and Bangkok. how do you deal with jet lag when you're Secretary of State? Just keep going. Okay. <laughs> it, you, all, you all travel, everybody travels a lot. I just, uh, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate I can, uh, I can sleep just about anywhere and get a couple hours sleep and be ready to, ready to get on. It uh, th doesn't bother me. Okay, so thank you very much for your service and thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you all very much. <laughs>